welcome to episode 10 of FNV, The Cutting Room 4. A series where we examine the cut content, design, and development of Fallout New Vegas. Jeff Hughes is a longtime area designer and writer at Obsidian who's had a hand in developing many of my favorite RPGs. However, his history with the Fallout series dates back to the ill-fated Project Van Buren. So to begin, I ask about his time at Black Isle. Back for the original Fallout 3, I'd only been a newbie designer at Black Isle for about three months before getting onto that project. Very awesome for me, since the whole reason I went to Interplay in the first place was because of Fallout. The one and only design document I did for the project was for Mesa Verde, based off concepts provided by Chris Avalon. It was still great to either implement, or at least reference the old Van Buren material in New Vegas, like the Crimson Caravan. Next, I asked Jeff when he joined Obsidian. I joined Obsidian in 2005 for Neverwinter Nights 2, and both expansions for that game. I was added to the New Vegas team right as that project started, and it felt great to finally resume the project I'd always wanted to be on. Unfinished business, as it were, and with the added benefit that I was a much more experienced designer who knew what pitfalls to avoid and what gameplay aspects to focus on. Moving on, I ask if working on FNV changed his approach to game design. I'm not sure New Vegas changed my approach to game design too much. I've always been a cautious, conservative designer by nature. If anything, I'm much more willing to set aside time to make sure the player has at least one memorable experience in one of my areas, like the X-42 giant robo-scorpion and legendary bloatfly. It's always been helpful to read the forums to gauge what content the players seem to enjoy the most. The X-42 and Legendary Bloatfly stand out to me as two of the most memorable and difficult encounters in New Vegas. So I asked Jeff about his process for designing them. The concept for the X-42 was created by Avalon, and it was pretty much, there's a giant robo-scorpion, homage to Wasteland, guarding Mobius. It was up to me to figure out what it did, so I probably spent two weeks just trying out different abilities and scripts to make it feel like a proper boss battle. It was a little challenging, since the game generally doesn't handle overly large creatures too well with regards to pathing. So I had to do extra tweaks to prevent the robot from trying to chase the player around. Ultimately, it was something like, if the player is outside melee range, always shoot tail, otherwise hit with claws. The bullet fly was just for fun. We had an empty cave that someone had built, and Charlie Staples said we should put a legendary bullet fly in there, so I did. I goofed around with scripting combat abilities until I finally settled on a super drugged up bloat fly that shot plasma bolts and exploded like a plasma grenade when it died. Good times. I followed up with lead area designer Charlie Staples, and he had this to say about the legendary bloat fly. I actually saw the idea for the legendary bloat fly on a post in some FNV forum. Don't remember exactly where anymore. Players were going over the various legendary creatures they'd like to see, and someone mentioned a bloat fly and listed crazy stats. I saw that, and thought it fit pretty well with the Old World Blues DLC, so we added it in there. I'm happier with how it turned out. It was a good fit, and people had a lot of fun finding it and playing with it with videos. I still have a really old link to this one pitting it against a legendary Deathclaw. If you're interested in the video Charlie sent me, I've linked it below. Next, I inquired about the responsibilities of area designers on the project, and which areas Jeff specifically designed. 
For New Vegas, the area designers were responsible for everything in a town slash dungeon. Way out, quest, NPCs, most dialogue, loot, combat, and scripted events. My areas were Good Springs, Jacobstown, The Fort, Westside, NCR Sharecropper Farms, Sloan slash Quarry Junction, and probably a few more small areas I've forgotten about. I also did a ton of quest. I'm especially fond of the Remnant and Four Auld Lang scene based off Sawyer's concepts. I also got the honor of writing Marcus and meeting Michael Dorn at the VO session. As you exit Doc Mitchell's house, you know you're in for something special. Einon Zor's score swells, and the scene slowly comes into focus, revealing the rusted remains of Good Springs. The audio and area design work in perfect tandem to create a visceral experience. No matter how many times I replay New Vegas, I'll never get tired of this. As you explore the town, you discover the shimmering neon lights of the saloon, the swirling dust clouds, the ominous cemetery looming just over the hill, the brewing battle between the powder gangers and the settlers, and all the while, Victor mysteriously watching over you. Together, these elements culminate in one of the most iconic vistas in the game, so I had to ask Jeff about his process for designing it. I looked up Real World Good Springs and identified the locations that we needed, like the general store, the bar, and the schoolhouse. I had free reign on the way out of the town, but it was most important to get the icon shot of the bar next to the general store, complete with motorcycles. One of the requirements with Good Springs was to make sure all character builds got some reactivity in town since this is the first place you encounter right after character creation. It didn't have to be anything elaborate, and I think for many tag skills, it was just an additional dialogue option so the player could show off his character's expertise in a subject. The most challenging requirement to implement was the mandatory character respec option when you leave Good Springs. In other Bethesda games, the player is always going through a tutorial vault slash cave slash jail with one exit, and you can fire the respec menu at that one exit. Good Springs, not so easy. The player could be wandering out of town in any direction. During character creation, Doc Mitchell asks you to fill out a form regarding your medical history before the trait menu appears. However, an image remains from when the player would have literally filled out a form instead. There are also unused check marks that would have shown which traits you had chosen. This is particularly interesting because it's from a point in development where traits hadn't been finalized yet. Many traits that appear in the final game are missing, and several options appear that went unused. For instance, ability to get cheap items at low prices, but ineptitude at dealing with bigger ticket items. Talent at wounding things up, lack thereof when it comes to patching them back up, fast movement when crouched, but slow to change stances. I asked Jeff about this, and he replied, This section was actually all Eric Fenstermaker, so it's possible the history form was just an early draft that ended up being cut for time. So I followed up on this with area designer Eric Fenstermaker. That does ring a bell. I'm not positive, but I believe it would have been a design choice. We did Good Springs early enough in the project that we were not severely pressed for time yet. Think it might have just been too complicated a framework for a simple choice. During the quest Run Good Springs Run, the Courier aids Joe Cobb and the Powder Gangers in taking over Good Springs. In the quest script, there's an unused variable for freeing the Bighorners in town. They also have an unfinished AI package that was intended for this. Presumably, after unlocking their pen, they would have attacked the townspeople during the battle. 
Considering this would have been a cool addition to one of the very first quests that the player encounters, I asked Jeff why it was cut. I think I tried this out, and ultimately cut it when the results kept being unpredictable. Like the Bighorner is not doing anything, or taking off into the hillsides for whatever reason. Hey, if it makes you feel any better, it's nothing personal. Just bad luck. <laughs> There's an unused intro rendered in-engine of the scene where Benny attempts to execute the courier. Notably, it also includes Victor digging up the courier from their grave, something that's only referenced in dialogue in the final game. The dialogue is different and less polished, but otherwise it essentially mirrors the FMV intro. There's also an alternate set of unused lines intended for this scene, Interestingly, the intro actually runs when you start a new game, but it's immediately skipped and the FMV is played in its place. I asked Jeff about this, and he replied, I'm not entirely sure about this one. It's possible that the in-game version was done before we learned we were getting an FMV intro, or the in-game version was done as a template that the FMV would draw upon. More of a Sawyer question. So naturally, I followed up with Josh. We initially attempted to do the opening cutscene in-engine. We based the cutscene's design upon things that we understood as technically possible, based on the cutscenes we saw in Fallout 3. There were no features we were relying upon that did not already exist in the engine. We attempted this for about a month, but the cutscene was unstable. Animations would desync and the sequence would break with high frequency. It may very well have been that we were using the technology incorrectly, but I made the decision to move to a pre-rendered cutscene to move things along and ensure stability. If you're interested in watching this intro, I've uploaded it along with its alternate dialogue. Finally, the residents of Good Springs have unused recorded dialogue titled Tribute of Terror. These lines imply that the player could have extorted caps from the townspeople. Please, please don't hurt us no more. I'm begging you. We'll, we'll pay you. Whatever we got, you can have it. We'll put together a collection every couple of days. We'll leave it under a rock beneath the old windmill. Think of it as, as a sign of respect. However, there are no clues as to what actions would have triggered these lines. I asked both Eric Finstermaker and Jeff Hughes about this, but unfortunately, neither were sure why this was ultimately cut. It seems very likely it was related to the Powder Gangers conquering Good Springs, but with no other information, that's simply conjecture. And that's all for this episode. As always, thanks for watching, and like and subscribe for more content like this.